Everyone, welcome back to the bar. Tonight we have Dr. David Seaman again on deck. Can't wait to talk everything chronic pain to the game changers and everything in between. Let's go. Tonight we're back. Dr. David Seaman is here. And so this is another We Back episode. We Back. And not only is it a We Back episode, it is also a Hey man, what's up my man? Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Having a good time. Enjoying the COVID lifestyle down in my world. Man, just doing everything that we can. What are you drinking tonight? Well, I'm drinking Cabernet in a measuring cup. What in the hell is that? Well, first of all, it doesn't spill over. <laughs> so, so if I'm working at the computer, so here's a story. This is a good one. So, so I, uh, I have this glass of wine in a STEM class, I think it was, and, and, and my brother was, was visiting. He comes over, looks at my computer. He was drinking something, too. I said, you know, be careful around the computer. So I just happened to tip the STEM glass, and I unload Cabernet in my computer. Right. So I realized that the only way to work is to have a very, very flat cup. And this way you also measure so you don't go full alcoholic every night. <laughs> so, you, so, so you temper your behavior, you know? So, I, so I'm sitting here. I started at eight ounces. I'm down to about 6.2. There you go. My man, I went truly again, and I feel really sad doing this because this is two weeks in a row that I pulled this card, as opposed to having a great whiskey or something I enjoy. I went with the uh, hydrating with a touch of pineapple and a little bit of alcohol. Uh, and we've also got some incredible rain and lightning on deck right now. So hopefully that doesn't mess up the show, but it, uh, it sure sounds like it's dropping a bomb on us. Tonight, I want to revisit the reason that we do this every single week. We do our Cheers to Charity, and our charity this week is the Halifax Humane Society. David, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Well, I just like dogs. I always like dogs. I miss my dog from when I was a kid. So there are pictures that I have of me when I'm like three years old. I remember when we got the dog, and I was afraid of fast-moving things because I'm kind of like on the edge a little bit, you know? And so fast moving things bother me, loud noises bother me. So my parents got this dog, it was a collie poodle. And so I remember sitting there at the window and the dog and its brother or sister were like chasing each other around the house. And I was like, I remember that when I was three years old. So I just love dogs. I just don't have one currently because of, of, of my traveling lifestyle. But if my COVID lifestyle continues, I may get a couple of Dobermans just to scare people. I hear you. We just got a dog to, recently. To really keep the social distancing. See, Dobermans and Pitbulls <laughs> facilitate social distancing. It's funny how that works. It's actually a really, really good deterrent. I want to talk a little bit about our sponsor, which is actually Deflame.com and everything that David Siemens ever produced. Talk about some of the most incredible nutrition information that's instantly digestible. It's take home, ready to go incredible. It's changed our lives. It's changed the doctor's lives in our clinic and in so many patients by understanding very complex topics in a very simple way. So David, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, enjoying this rainy evening here in Hendersonville, Nashville, Tennessee, sharing it with us. Hey, thanks for having me. We had our rain today. We had a lightning strikes, multiple lightning strikes. Yeah. I think and that like, just pushed its way up here because it feels like it's happening. It, it was it was pretty fierce. I mean, I'm watching it from my windows. Lightning strikes, boom! My brother texts me. He goes, he goes, a lightning bolt just hit the tree between me and my neighbor's house. Dang! Yeah, a lot of fierce strikes. Yeah, yeah. Man, tonight, the big things I wanted to get into, I had a whole laundry list of things I wanted to talk about. Um, we had so many questions from our last show, and one of the uh, ones that came out right away was, "What is something in your house, like maybe?" two to five items that are staples in the kitchen that make it easier to make some of those decisions that you were talking about last time. Meaning, uh, to recap for those that weren't able to join us last time, several of the things that were amazing tips from Dr. Seaman last time were, if you have junk food in your house, then that's gonna be something that ideally you have as a one serving event that's not over the top that you can't just keep going back to because the comfort levels or the boredom levels of being in quarantine or just being in a COVID era 
Uh, we're seeing that people on average have already gained 16 to 19 pounds. These types of things are things that we need to take control of. And so one of the great questions that we didn't get to get to last time was, okay, well, let's flip that script a little bit. What are a few of the items that are staples that maybe work in a lot of different meals or things that are a little bit easier to be able to consume that don't instantly turn off somebody that doesn't pay attention to nutrition normally? Well, for me, I've got it's mostly frozen stuff because really, mm. in the end, like the frozen vegetables, to me, I mean, I'm fresh are probably better, but I don't know how much. And so, frozen is always good. So I got a freezer full of frozen vegetables and frozen meat of all varieties and fish. I've got salmon, flounder, anything else? Salmon, flounder, and then and then lamb, beef, uh, and bacon. Is it the, is it the same with meat <laughs> as far as frozen meat? Yeah. Yeah. And it lasts forever. As long as you don't have, it doesn't thaw out. Frozen meat's pretty much good forever. So yeah. as long as, and, and then, and then also, you know, like you're talking about heavy cream in the coffee in the morning. Yeah. So I just, so, so I had a, essentially my dinner early this afternoon and I had dessert afterwards and mm. my dessert was frozen cherries with some heavy cream poured on it. Nice. So it's like cherry vanilla ice cream. So in, so in the freezer, I can live out of my freezer. I don't have to worry about anything crispy, crunchy, snack. I mean, I like it, but it's just better to try to like keep that stuff under control to keep your weight. Like you should never be any heavier than you are right now. And neither should I, unless we get built up with a bunch of muscle. Otherwise yeah. we should never gain any weight. What's the narrative behind why not to eat frozen vegetables? That seems to be something, you know, the fresh, it, it, where's that narrative coming from? Obviously it's likely better, but um, that's not an argument you hear very often, which is, hey, crush the frozen veggies. They're probably just as good because typically the frozen veggies, they're trying to get as ripe as possible, I'm assuming. And then they're now cutting them, prepping them, packaging them and trying to deliver yeah. them in that facet. Um, what's the argument for and against that? I really don't even know. Yeah. Slightly less nutritious, maybe. Yeah. Uh, the canned stuff is typically salty. Sure. And... I don't even know, you know I, I haven't checked recently the nutritional value of canned can vegetable with its frozen counterpart with its fresh counterpart. I haven't checked recently. Fresh is best, and then next frozen, and then worse would be canned. Yeah. So, 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 so people shouldn't work. Like my, my brother I was telling you about, about earlier, when he lost his like almost 50 pounds, now he's basically doing like the one and a half meal a day deal to get back to where he was. Mm. But, but when he did that, he, he initially uh, wasn't sure what to do. So he ate like roast beef, cheese, carrots, and celery and some nuts, you know, and, that, and eggs and bacon and whatever and that kind of stuff. And it evolves as you get more into it. But, you know, I, I just don't think that you should pressure people to have to do frozen, we have to do fresh, have to do organic because my brother never touched an organic piece of meat or, or ate an organic vegetable or had an organic anything else and he shredded 60 pounds, his asthma went away, his adult onset asthma went away, sleep got better, post nasal drip disappeared, and all his aches and pains went away. Yeah. With no, nothing organic, nothing organic. Yeah. I think the important thing there is, is that leads right into the topic of all the different supplements that we can take and the difference between our macronutrients and micronutrients and then being able to get those. Someone was just asking the other day that was that saw the show, we talked a little bit about that, about taking our vitamins. And I think the hard part for people to understand is the, or at least to wrap our head around, it's so much marketing as far as how important all these different supplements are. And people, I guess at some point, lose sight of that idea that if I'm eating something, there's more to it than just, is it a protein, is it a carb, or is it a fat? And I think that's where the discussion stops usually when they think about that or they'll say, oh, maybe there's some fiber in there, but they forget about the other vitamins in the foods. Is that something that you think the average person should pay more attention to, less attention to, or just track the simple calories in, calories out, uh, or the foods we eat and time restricted? So time restricted is best, at least 13 hours of, of time restricted feeding. Cause, cause, and I realized this, I learned this when I was, when I was finishing up or writing the, the breast cancer book, the breast health, breast cancer book that women who, so they, so they looked at women who had breast cancer, they had surgery and then, uh, and medications and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, radiation and, and they tracked recurrence 
And, and women who, 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 who fasted 13 hours at least per night had less recurrence than those who were less than 13 hours. So that to me is like the starting point. And you can do 23 hours if you're really, really committed. Uh, but the average person, you know, the average person, they struggle. Yeah. So the idea of fasting itself across the board, you have to be mentally committed to that. So start off with just, I mean, if, if, if you pick out at, eight, at, at say six, have a snack at 10 o'clock, and then wake up and you sleepwalk and you have a donut and then you wake up and eat, you know, it all depends like where you are to start this and kind of like start to get the hours lengthened a little bit. So, yeah. so that would be the first thing. And the other thing too is not to get caught up on carbs, proteins, and fats because, mm -hmm. because there is no such thing as in nature, pure carbohydrate, pure protein, or pure fat. Maybe if you're eating rabbit, you're getting like, a lot of protein, almost all protein, some glycogen in the muscle, but rabbits have virtually no fat at all. Mm. And there's actually like a rabbit, I forget the rabbit something or other. And I learned about this when I was reading about really the most famous of all uh, keto guys. His name is uh, Stefanson. He's, he's, he's from uh, Canada, born like late 1800s, died <laughs> 80 some years later. And he lived with the Eskimos in the Arctic Circle for like nine years. Wow. And a pure, pure meat those nine years. Now, the Eskimos, you know, if, if you think about, say, well, Greenland, where they call it green, and Iceland is like less icy than Greenland is more icy. You know how that works? It's ridiculous. Greenland is not very green. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know why they call it Greenland, man. It's just a weird thing. Not that Iceland is like all green. It's certainly icy. But so, so if, you're, if you're a Greenland Eskimo and, and you're living towards the Arctic Circle, you have virtually no green time. You got to go south to go to, you know, to get the green. And so, but if you're living on the border and all of a sudden the berries and the fruits and whatever else appears and the honey, you're going to do it because it tastes better than just walrus meat, right? So most people who were keto most of the year did it because of latitude. It's like a latitude longitudinal diet. That's actually the paleo diet is a latitude longitude diet. So if you come down at whatever latitude, but then you go across the earth, it depends where you are. So at one point, the latitude could be tropical or at the same latitude elsewhere, it could be, it could be desert. Mm. So mm. the people who lived in various longitude and latitudes, they ate what was there natural. So they ate food. They didn't go, what's my protein? They didn't know what protein was. So they ate food. So people should eat food and not worry about protein, fat, carbohydrate, unless what they're doing is keto then it's very important to have very little carbohydrate, small amount of protein, maybe 30% calories, and the rest fat. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the average omnivore or vegan shouldn't worry about that. They should worry about food, whole food. Pretty simple. No, and I if think they do that and, and they eat enough of it, then they're going to get their micronutrients. And then it can, then it can supplement with like basic, simple supplements for the purpose of just supplementing the diet rather than pretending that supplements are somehow treaters of specific named diseases. Like, for example, for migraine headaches, magnesium is very, very helpful. Oh, wait, that's for migraine. Well, for widespread pain called fibromyalgia, magnesium is very helpful. Magnesium for fibromyalgia. Hey, how much is magnesium for everything? Why spend time picking a name of a disease and trying to target specific nutrients for it? It makes no sense to do mm. it that way. That, may, that is very enlightening. One thing that I want to jump right into coming off of that is just, I have several patients on my heart today because I know coming up in the next week or two, we have one of the top pain management rehabilitation docs in all of Nashville. And so many cases that we've been able to collaborate with over the years have dealt with many that have been in these fibromyalgia states and these chronic pain, miserable states for so long, or they've been through some really intense surgeries that maybe didn't go as hoped. And then now they're trying to make the best of it. But in almost every one of these cases, the things we see is their, their activity goes down completely. Their weight goes up consistently. Their emotional state is down. When you can bring all these together and you see how they're coping, and then now we bring them into the office and do an evaluation or try to work with them, 
one of the things that we see all the time is that they just can't tolerate touch anymore. They're completely intolerant to everything that we know that if they stuck with it for three to six weeks would start to show signs of improvement. But the food piece or the at home self food selection piece is the hardest for them to tackle. Right. I, I think we could take this from every single angle, but I empathize with them so much because I've, you know, there's been times where we've been through really rough patches. And the number one thing that I want to do is cope with smashing five hamburgers. Um, I I get that. That's what I want to do. I want to snack and I eat my feelings. That's been my MOs, you know, forever. I, I get where they're coming from. And sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it. But when you are in those times of chronic pain and it doesn't seem like you're getting much enjoyment out of anything but food at that point, Obviously, you need your whole medical team around you, but there's got to be, at some point, it can't completely be emotional-based coping. There has to be some level of logic that can get through there or they can hear the right message. And I just don't know of many experts to be able to help share that message as good as you could be able to do it. So I'm really interested in when you think about that individual that's going through that and they're, they're having that struggle and they're saying, look, not everybody around me has had a surgery that didn't go well. Not everybody around me is dealing with these you know, massive pain states and people just don't understand what's going on. So they self-cope or self-soothe with food. What's a way to slowly start that conversation or a message for them to hear that gets them on the right direction? that doesn't feel instantly so intense or so far out there to steal a phrase from you earlier of for the average person, they just can't do it. Where's that entry point for that person that's in massive chronic pain? Yeah, well, there's so many different versions of that, of course, right? So you have somebody who uh, is, is, is pre, so, so the, uh, the picture of my book behind you on the bottom where that wave is washing out the cupcakes and the cupcakes and the white bread and the french fries yeah yeah so that those calories are the enemy period they are the enemy of humanity they are actually the enemy of humanity in our current crisis because uh the whole covid thing has gotten so emotional and so political even and lost in the message is that those calories create the worst COVID outcomes, except for in the extremely old and very frail and sick people who are close to the end anyway. So when I say that, I'm not saying it in a callous way because because very few people, very few people um, alive or dead actually were able to like meet all four grandparents and two or just one great grandparent. Hmm. So I know my father's, grandfather so great grandfather my dad's side and my and 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 his grandmother his mother's mother and and my grandmother's sister my great aunt she looked to be over a hundred so so my great aunt was in a was in a a a nursing home type facility long-term care facility and when i walked through there to visit her as often as i could it was really kind of like man these people are so sick so they're on the edge. And so for those people, no, it's it's a hit or miss thing with this whole COVID deal. Mm. If they get it and if it spreads through, because they're already on the edge, they're all flamed up and the flame is what drives it, you know, the, the, the death blow anyway. But the other population that is at great risk, the obese population. So those calories on that book to you over your left shoulder, uh, those are the problem. Mm. And the bigger problem is that if people... See, so let's just say if you or I, like I, I mean, everyone's an emotional eater. That that's just is that's biology, human biology. Unless you're really, really exceptionally, exceptionally focused, everyone's an emotional eater. Hmm. And so, like my brother, uh, who was on the cover of my weight loss book, he he was fit and healthy, and then he gained 150 pounds, and he had to like just get in charge of his brain again, and now he is so exceptionally disciplined, it's unbelievable. So no matter, and, and I'll tell you something, uh, almost nobody treats or sees people who have who have uh, severe cases of, of true spasmodic torticollis 
mm. which is also called cervical dystonia. These yeah. people, there's actually a Vanderbilt, well, that'd be Memphis. Uh, there is a Vanderbilt specialist out there in uh, for uh, cervical dystonia where, so, so my brother was so miserable. And the thing about it is that you're spazzing and in pain. And when you fall asleep, you're relaxed. You wake up and it starts again. So he had to, he had to rework everything in his life, deal with all that exceptional pain every day and focus on hopefully a decent outcome where he has good days now and not so good days, but he never touches the sugar, flour, refined oil calories, except for the most rare, 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 rarest of occasions. And so it's hard to, it's hard to find someone who is more miserable laying on his back most of the day, writhing in pain. When he would eat, he would just shovel food in his mouth like a maniac and stay up late and shovel food in his mouth. I mean, that right there is as bad a case as you're going to get, except for the fact that he didn't have to have surgery, although he did have Botox. So he had to work through it in his head. He mm -hmm. had to develop mindfulness and he had to focus on, I mean, truly focus on the hope of being pain-free or somewhat more functional in the future. And now he does is he spends time, basically, uh, he wrote a book on dystonia. He wrote a book in, and, and, and a lot of dystonia people, or at least he had the problem with the benzodiazepine thing because he was mismanaged. Mm. So he has an entire chapter about benzodiazepine and dealing with the fact that once you take benzos, you pretty much, even if you want to stop, you have to titrate off so carefully because the, the, the withdrawal from benzos can be quite catastrophic. Yeah. So he, so he went through all of that, and now he weighs what he weighed before it all happened. Now, he knew me, obviously. I've known him his whole life, and he knew, he's known me his whole life, and, he's, and he knows what's in that book behind you because he edited the thing. He knew about it anyway. So you just have to just suck it up. Speaking of suck it up, uh, a, a Cairo buddy of mine is also an MD. He's in the military, and he just got back from – he's either in Afghanistan or Kuwait – and so they fly over and they got to adapt to a brand new time zone to be regimented. So, so, so what the military guys call is they call it, you got to embrace the suck, embrace the suck, work through it. Yeah. And so now that may not be like, uh, if you're laying there writhing in pain, like that's very difficult to do. So you got to do it step by step by step. And most people, so let's just say that you were in an accident or I was in an accident the odds of you or I becoming obese would be less because we have more of a, of, a, of a mindfulness about good food in advance. But if you're living on crap your whole life and you have no mindfulness towards your food, and then you get hurt and then you're depressed. So you're in chronic pain with depression. Now it's very, very difficult. So you basically just have to give that up. So what, what my brother, my brother was a great baseball player. He could smack a home runs 400 feet. He could smack a golf ball a mile. He's a great, great, great athlete. So he just he so so he realized at one point that he had to give up his previous life mm. and embrace his new life. And so if you're in chronic pain, you got to embrace the suck, examine yourself, look at where you're screwing up, write them down, take stock of where you are, and then focus on correcting those errors in your life, which all of us have to varying degrees. But when you're in chronic pain, the things that the average person can do without even worrying about it people in chronic pain often cannot do. Mm. That would be the best general advice for, for people. And when it comes to the whole pain thing, they have to realize that the flame is what drives it, whether it's widespread pain, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, because oh, fibro, migraine, uh, gut pain, musculoskeletal pain, localized, they're all different general mechanisms but very, very similar specific mechanism in terms of the activation of, of the pain system. So the, gen so the mechanisms are different, like say a migrainer. See, so the average migrainer is just a genetic migrainer and they just have a trigger and this little area in the area between their, well, brainstem area is like always triggering and it needs the right stimulus and boom, it fires a migraine. So people who have Chronic back pain don't have that, but what drives all of those, those, the, those various conditions, the flame is the issue. And so you have to then say, okay, so psychological stressors, what am I doing in my life psychologically that I know I shouldn't do that is a stressful to me and I got to get rid of it. Mm. I got to become a new person. So my brother became a new Tom and gave up the old Tom. Very difficult, very, very difficult. But that is what people have to do who are in chronic pain. If like I, for my 
for my COVID lifestyle, I dropped my handicap from a 10 to a six. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, I'm a legitimate eight. I mean, I think that, that they, that they deflate handicaps in the whole, in the whole USDA, I mean, the whole USGA thing. But the point though is, is that if I, if I was in such pain that I couldn't play golf, I would give it up and do something else. You know, you have to be adaptable. And that is the main thing, be resilient and adaptable. And the more flamed up one is and the more, and the less resilient their body and minds are to dealing with change. I think that's probably the biggest take home from this episode is going to be that be resilient, be willing to change and don't have that fixed mindset, have that growth mindset. Something that we work on all the time with patient cases that come in that have persistent pain is we're trying to find how can we get them consistently active again? And I think one of the most underrated facets of cardio is that, and most people would call cardio, that's your walking, your jogging, your rowing, your, <laughs> dude, that wine glass is the greatest thing yeah. I've ever effing seen. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a mind track. I knew where I was going and that shit went out the window so fast just now. <laughs> Sorry. That was fantastic. I completely forgot that happened. I melt butter in that same exact Laughter size. Laughter is really good, man. Glass. Laughter is really good. <laughs> yeah. So what are you doing? What's up? Uh, so, well, I, uh, I just, uh, I just finished this book. Ooh. Ooh. So when does that there. drop on Amazon? That's all I care about. The drops on Amazon tomorrow. Sold. And so you see this guy right here. This is a guy's pant. This is his waistline. Yes. And that's his big belly filled with, with pro-inflammatory foods. So here's the reason why this is so important in this time, because, because when you think about how how really stressed out a lot of people are, and they're and they're somewhat hysterical about about passing the virus around. You know, the first thing that one has to realize, like to me, the word pandemic is really not. I mean, to call something a pandemic that kills uh, less than one percent of the infected people under age seventy, that pandemic is too aggressive a word hmm. to to describe it. Because when I think of pandemic, I think of millions and millions of people dying and decaying and having to have mass burials because everyone's dying so brutally. This is not like that. It takes out a specific population of people, those who are already very, very ill before they catch it. And that can be young kids who are ill in the hospital. You know, the, the Arnold Palmer um, hospital for little kids, like little kid cancer hospitals, right? So, so there are some very, very sick young people and there are very sick old people. And, and those are the ones who should be protected from everybody else. And the biggest, the biggest driver of the, of the viral spread is Big Daddy right here and Big Mama. So I want to come straight out the lost. gate with the immune health. So the immune health, I can't wait to hear. I don't want you to give all the spoilers away that you put in the book, but I think that uh, I want to come at it from the instantly skeptical approach. So I have okay. not, I was not offered the ability to pre-read the book before release. So right. I have not got to read the book. I have no idea what's in the text. But here's what I instantly uh, goes off in the radar about immune health. I can't wait to read it because I just know how well you always do your due diligence and then are able to present the evidence in, in a sensible way that makes sense. But anytime I hear someone say boosting immunity, it's, I don't know if frustrating is the right word, but it throws off the alarm of how the hell are we measuring that? So for example, there are a lot of different professions that will say, I can do X, Y, or Z modality to you and your immune health will improve. And what is our test, retest, and marker or metric for measurement? We all have heard a million times, exercise, great for immune health. But all right, cool. How are we measuring that? That sleep, getting effective sleep, great for immune health. Awesome. How are we quantifying that? You know, these are the types of things that jump into my head instantly as a, a provider who really cares about public health, that cares about obviously our patients, not overstepping, but also not ignoring the value in everything that you and I have talked about before, which is number one, if you're walking up to the wall and your belly hits before your nose, there's likely an inflammation problem, right? Right, exactly. If, if 
the weight, all the different measurements we've talked about before, you know, those are all things that really matter. But if we're talking immune health, can you explain that a little bit? And then maybe a couple of the avenues that we could understand, how could we ever possibly measure that in an individual? Sure. So, so one of the, on, on, on the back of the book, it has, you know, what's in there. And so uh, here is like the fifth bullet down. Why immune boosting is a superficial goal. Because, hot. yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I've got like 12 videos on the whole immune health COVID Ooh, nice. and stuff on a, a deflamed nutrition YouTube. So, 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 so boosting, you know, boosting your immune system is, is just exceptionally superficial. And so when you think about like the word immunity, right? So if you're, if you're immune to something, you won't, you won't get it, right? So they say, I want to, so boosting immunity really means that, but what does that even mean though? It doesn't really, so, so, so that's really bad language. So when you start talking about immune system, you're talking about cells. So what cells do you want to boost? I mean, how do you, are they unboosted before the thing comes along? So you're exactly <laughs> right. How, how, I mean, it's frankly, it's frankly so shallow. It's so shallow. It's just, it's sort of mind boggling. So, 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 so what happens for somebody who is, who, who is obese? So first let me just, just, I don't want to just kind of just, just, just kind of look at my thing here just because in case I forget the order. So seven things about, about the obese population. And when I say obese population is really important because people say, well, skinny people have died of COVID too. Yeah. They were either pre-flamed and sick or they were actually, now this is something that virtually nobody knows about. It was first written about in 1981 and it's called normal weight metabolic obesity. Mm. So skinny fat people. So you can be fat and not flamed, but if you're a fat fatty and you're flaming, problem. You can be skinny and no flame. You can be skinny fat and flaming. So skinny fat people, they have, and you have life people in your office, they've got zero muscle mass. They're weak as can be. They're soft. So those people have unhealthy body fat, no different than obese people. And because they lack so much muscle mass, they lack the organ that is responsible for taking up glucose and maintaining proper glucose homeostasis. Hmm. So these skinny fat people have inflamed body fat and they're insulin resistant and hyperglycemic, just like obese people once they cross that threshold. So when I talk about obese, I'm talking about the obese, obese people, and then the normal weight, obese metabolic people. So here, here are the seven points. So first of all, obese people, and skinny fat obese people are more prone to viral infections and bacterial infections. How come we haven't heard about that? I have no we, idea. Because I, I remember, I remember learning about like covering your face sneezing when I was like three. Yeah. I mean, I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. No one had to say to me, "Cover your face," right? No one had to say, "Hey, you know, Uncle Joe or Daddy or so and so is sick. Stay away," right? Yeah. They're in the bedroom. You stay away. I learned that when I was two, three. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So we are given literally elementary school recommendations. Yeah. Now the new one is the whole mask thing. When people are running around mask shaming people as if as if just breathing is going to spread the thing, which is why their recommendation that you should wear a mask no matter where you are, even if you're outside, blah, blah, blah. A friend of mine was walking on the beach in South Florida by himself. I mean, by himself. Nobody in sight. Maybe a couple sharks. That's it. Some birds. No human walking by the water, and a cop rolls up on the uh, in his in his four wheeler and says, "You, you got to wear a mask." He's like, "I'm by myself. The only person here is you." Oh, well, that's the rule. You got to you, you got to wear a mask. Mm. So it's been taken to the point of just madness, and people are freaked mm. out. So obese people are, are much are much more readily infected. Obese people, when they are infected, they actually, you know how you talk about viral mutation mm -hmm. that takes place, the virus mutates? The obese body is a, is a bioreactor for viral mutations. Hmm. And the mutations that are created are more virulent. So lean, healthy people don't have that problem. What else do I, do I have the order there? So in uh, obese people, they shed more virus, like almost 40% more viral shedding than lean people. How come we don't hear about that? 
right? It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. What else? Uh, they stay infected longer, obviously. They are more contagious. Here's a good one. Uh, so if you think about if you're in a, an airport or wherever you are or, or in, a, in, a, in a waiting room at a at, could, could be a doctor's office, you can have some healthy guy there sitting there relaxing, you know, coming in for his annual check, but then you can have some enormous guy sitting next to him. Who's going to be more obviously breathing more heavily? Well, the, the thin guy will just be sitting there. You can't even see him breathe. The other guy. <sighs> so they breathe more. So it turns out that obese people, because they breathe more regularly, they release more viruses in their breath. <laughs> so they spread it more, right? And then for the vaccines, they're less uh, responsive to vaccines because they're so pro-inflammatory. How crazy is that? Yeah. So these people, these people, when they get infected, these are the, the obese population, forget the, you know, the outliers, which are the very old sick people and the very, you know, just, just the unhealthy fortunate young, young people just by no fault, just bad luck. So uh, what was my point? Uh, oh, geez, I just lost. I, I just saw myself taking a drink with my cup. I know, which is nice. <laughs> I will say straight on the topic, I remember that there was a, I believe it was a hyper uh, glycemia and hyperlipidemia um, study on, uh, they took deer and I've got to pull this back up because it's been a while a since I read deer? it. As, yeah, it was deer. A, and they took them and fed them to like two, same caloric restriction, but one got uh, mainly sugar and then one got uh, a, a mixture of other calories that weren't inflammatory. And they were dramatically different in their profiles that they noticed one became diabetic, even though they were in a slight caloric deficit. Uh, it was minimal or, or right about the same. Um, as, as what calories they were burning during the day and which was going on to the same type logic, but it was an animal study of that. It was actually with pigs. It was, it was with pigs mm. and they fed pigs, basically pig, the standard pig chow, which is hardly carbohydrate laden. And then they otherwise gave them vegetables and fish and some, and some beef. And they fed a little bit less calories. It was like 5,000 calories per day for 4,000 for the other. So I mean, they're pretty close. And the obesity and the and the hyperglycemia and the C-reactive protein was like non-existent in the, in those who ate the 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 the, the vegetable the, the whole food diet. Mm. Yeah, it was. I, I call it the paleo pig diet. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So it, so so so, so let me just kind of try, 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 try to get my head back to to the seven points. Take so a sip of the coffee. wine. Get the wine. Get the wine. That cup will it? bring it back. It'll bring it back. You want to see it? There we go. There we go. There we go. So you have those seven points about, about, about the obese population that is highly infectable and therefore infectious and contagious. Hmm. And, 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 and who in, 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 in government or media is actually saying, listen, you got to get your body fat down. Yeah, it is interesting that that has not been a topic at all. And the other piece is, all right, if you had to speculate, because we obviously don't have evidence for this, but if you are in a case where your your BMI is exceptionally high, or you just know you have, you're just quite a bit overweight, and you're not the same healthy weight that you used to be when you were 20, 21, how quickly do we think that you could start to see improvements in your health by going anti-inflammatory? So by eating better, how quickly could we see that superficial immunity change or feel like you're doing something going the right direction as opposed That's to the wrong the direction. I did the, so I'll tell you that in a second. So, so that was the reason why I went through those seven points for obesity. So, so these people are flaming. Their immune system is pumping out too many pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines. So the average person listening should know what a cytokine is these days because it's been in the media properly when they're talking about COVID-19 deaths is called the cytokine storm. So when we think about a storm, that's a big boost, right? I mean, that's a big boost in weather. Yeah. So, so if you want to talk about immune health, the immune system has, has pro-inflammatory sides and an anti-inflammatory side, and you want them to be both normal. So that if you have a challenge, the flame goes up and then the flame comes back down and you stay balanced. Mm. So the average person who is obese is, has, excess pro-inflammatory and reduced anti-inflammatory. 
So they're already boosted. When you get a fever, that is an immune boosting event. The yeah. immune system is turned on. And so obese people are already boosted. They need to basically inhibit their immune system back to normal. So that's where the story. It was a whole it was a whole boosting thing that we got. Yeah. So the whole boosting immunity is just so shallow, superficial, and biologically inaccurate. And so what was the guy? Hang on that. Hang on that for a second. So you hear it. people getting really hype about their tart cherry juice. And uh, what are a couple of these other supplements you hear everybody talk about? Can you just talk that topic for a second? Because I hear it around town as if they're immune, they're walking around in a force field. And I just don't know exactly where that comes from. Because again, I if I had to pick one topic I'm the least educated in, even though I do my best to consume uh, your content, I consume as as much of the the research as I can on it. Nutrition is just not my strong suit. I there's something, some switch mentally to where when I get to the biochemistry, I instantly start to think about a million other things I'd rather be doing. So I just can't do that. But when we get to muscle health, nerve health, chronic pain, all of these other topics and management. I, I could go all day and never take a break. But as soon as we start talking about the food piece, I just can't do it. So can you explain a little bit, what's the narrative behind I'm crushing tart cherry juice every night or I take turmeric all the time and now I, I literally can't be busted? Yeah, well, first of all, they can. And if you're listening, don't freak out because uh, I don't want to uh, burst someone's bubble uh, because there's no way that turmeric, here, they're going to die someday. So clearly it's not that powerful, right? <laughs> right. What an angle. Right. What an angle. Okay. But, I mean, so I, but that's what it is though. Is that because so, you're defining age and the aging process as an inflammatory event? No, it's just that it's, it's just that when people get like trapped into something, it, if it works for them, then they just obsess over it because it works for them. And so if you're a tart cherry person, the reason why tart cherry has benefit is because it's filled with, it's, it's, it's rich in, in, in what we used to be called bi bioflavonoids, now called polyphenols. And polyphenols are really anti-inflammatory. So someone can be a tart cherry devotee, and the next person could be a turmeric devotee. They both uh, deliver anti-inflammatory benefits because of their, their, their polyphenol bioflavonoid. Uh, so content. that makes now, no like, sense to a simpleton like myself. If I smash, if I go over here to five guys, I kill a double burger with cheese, whole thing of, of fries, and then a cherry, um, a cherry milkshake because they're incredible from five guys. If you haven't been there and had the cherry milkshake, get your ass there immediately. It's incredible. All right. So you go <laughs> drop that. You're dropping 3,200 calories pretty quick, pretty easy to do. And it's, it's a really great time, especially if you get to catch up and all the other things. All right. So I hit that. And then now I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to hit my four ounces or whatever it is of tart cherry juice. Will that counteract that? Probably not. I would not count on that. <laughs> My, now, there my is. issue now, is, wait, wait, what's the weight? Wait. Like, if that's helping, okay. if anti-inflammatory is a thing, and then I'm smashing a bunch of inflammatory things, is there some random or magic ratio that makes it okay? Where, ooh, I can eat this much crap, and then I just hit my tart cherry juice, and then, you know, have a little turmeric, and then I'm good. Okay, I'll give you an example of, of how this would work. So, 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 so in the Game Changers... Uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Scamumentary? It's not really, it's not accurate. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, exercise guy, and it's really interesting. So, so the, so the guy, James, whatever his name was, was basically, a, this is the had, Netflix no, documentary. You're talking yeah, about the, the Netflix, Netflix. that yeah, got yeah. massive hype about three months ago. Yeah. 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 Ga yeah. The game changers thing. So, so it was all about how, how terrible animal fat is and, 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 and meat protein and animal protein is. And so when you look at the father, and of course, he can start talking about this guy's father who's like 75 or so, 70, I think he was. My father, who's 85, looks just as good as that guy who's 70. Probably better, actually, because my father has been pounding vegetables for like ever. He's a maniac. My father wants to 
live longer than his aunt who lived to be a hundred. So what's the premise of game changers for those that haven't seen that, that are hitting in the share button and the like button right now. What are, what was the premise behind game changers in two sentences? Uh, That being a vegan is the only way to live a healthy life. Yeah. Animal fat, animal protein, it causes heart disease, cancer, and every, every disease known to man. And the evidence for this is uh, James, I forget what his name is. So, so, so they start, you have to start someplace and the average person starts where in five guys, right? That's where the average person starts. And so, yeah. So, so when you're in five guys, what kind of green vegetables do you, do you get there? Man, they put lettuce on my burger every time and I'm very upset. They shred it. It's there. It just falls off. Gets in my ketchup. That's my only beef is when I take the burger, dip it in the ketchup, it leaves the lettuce remnants behind. Otherwise I'd be fine. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's essentially zero vegetation calories at five guys. That's offensive. when you do I, I, Listen, I get that. I mean, listen, but, but you should watch my, my, my people can go to my deflame nutrition, YouTube channel, and watch my videos, the deflame diet at five guys. So I show you how to do it. Ooh, baby. Why didn't you tell me this is, sooner? I'm in. The problem is the problem is there's no shake. There are no fries and there's no bun. So to hell with David Seaman. That's it. That's all there is to it. You took away all my loves from the place yes. that I adore. Except if you go to Five Guys and just get the the double cheese, the double bacon cheeseburger with no bun, extra vegetation, extra vegetation. You eat it once it's in your mouth. You really can't tell that there's no bun there because all all the meat and the, everything else kind of blends in there. So anyway. The, the, the game changers mentality about eating of a, a non-vegan diet is five guys like you just described. And so, and so they go, it's like a pendulum swinging from complete sugar, flour, fat to over here, only vegetables. Mm. I mean, you just missed everything in between. And that is what these radicals do not understand. So, the game changers suggest, well, they actually said in this, let me get this here. Okay. Whoops. So, so, so the game changers cited this article and I of course watched it slow and I had to like pause it and get the reference. It was called the hamburger study. And so James, whatever his name is, uh, said to the hamburger study, when they ate the hamburger, there was 70% more inflammation, uh, than, uh, uh, before they ate the hamburger. And so I get the paper and it was a hamburger avocado study, which he conveniently left out because when you're ideologically possessed and excessively biased by anything, you, you lose information. So people might say, you know, say if someone was, was going to be critical, well, you know, how are you biased? You can be a vegan, you can be an omnivore or a carnivore and be deflamed. You just have to do it right. And you do it by monitoring your calories and keeping pro-inflammatory calories out. So if you want to be a carnivore, you don't eat a bunch of French fries with your walrus meat. Stick to the walrus meat at a calorically <laughs> appropriate amount, right? Now, give me an example of like a, a pure, and they also call it plant-based, right? Yeah. That plant-based, like that's a very nice word. I thought I ate a plant-based diet until I found out from these guys, because to me, a plant-based is got a lot of vegetation on the base of your bowl, and on top, you got some fish. To me, that's plant-based. See, plant-based actually means plant only. So first mm. of all, they're liars. They're disingenuous. They should just say we are vegans and we don't think anyone should eat meat or any animal product. I have much more respect for them then. Mm. So here's what, here's what the narrator, and he's a mixed martial arts bodybuilder guy living on French fries and crap. So of course he hurts. If he just became a, a healthy omnivore, his aches and pains would have gone away too, like my brother. Hmm. But he, he's, he doesn't know anything. And so he's biased. So they talk about the hamburger study. So I'm like, wow, I'm game. I'll go get it. And this goes back to the, to the uh, tart cherries and the turmeric stuff. So, uh, and this is, so it was a hamburger and an avocado study. And I brought some, what do they call them when you're into kindergarten and you bring show and tell? You bring props. So from my front yard, side yard, sorry. I got avocados in my back, side, and front. This is a side yard avocado. Now, this is kind of shiny. 
Yeah, it's shiny. These are very thin skinned. You got to take a knife and peel it like you're peeling a potato. Well, check so this bad boy out. Look at this. Can you see this right now? Uh, That's a shot glass. The, the, I know, but the lighting's bad. This is a two docs shot glass that you can't That's really nice. see in the lighting. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. To get a two docs shot glass, how you get that is you donate to one of the charities on the two docs show. Come to Action Spine and Joint Center, bring your receipt. Doesn't matter the monetary value, and we will hook you up with a limited edition two docs shot glass. And they're actually going really fast. I was thinking, you know, we might give one or two away, but they're actually moving pretty good. So I will say nice. that if you um, take this as a big initiative, that right now what's way more important than anything else, donate to one of the charities, come get an amazing limited two docs shot glass. All right, That's you're back. Beautiful. Okay, so so this avocado is kind of like a small Haas. The Haas avocados, they got the hard kind of outside. You can kind of cut them in half and scoop them out. This one yeah. you can't because it's so thin. But look how big they get. And this is even, I've had, I have them bigger. Nice. So I actually, I actually have avocado props for the hamburger avocado story from Game Changers. So I go and I get the paper and it turns out that it's a hamburger and avocado story. So what, so what does that mean? Is, yeah, go for it. Okay, so what they did is they, is, is they gave, so first we have to realize that your gut is essentially functioning like a bioreactor. So whenever you add uh, vegetation to any meal in your gut, the vegetation tends to deflame anything that might be pro-inflammatory. So mm. in, the game, in the Game Changers movie, they, they, they force feed the idea that there's a 70% in inflammation when you eat meat. So I get the paper, and of course, I'm an inflammation guy, so I understand the language. And so this, the, the authors looked at tumor necrosis factor, and I think interleukin-8. They're just pro-inflammatory cytokines, okay? So pro-inflammatory, and they looked at something else called interleukin-6. So interleukin-6, its range is 0 to 12. That's normal. So this is the normal range of interleukin-6. So it started off here. They ate the meat and it went to here. It's still normal. Mm. You don't say, so they said it was 70% increase from the start, but it was within the normal range. It went from like a three to a five. Mm, that's shady. Beyond shady. It's, so, it's lying. Yeah. And it's fear mongering and lying. So then what they did is they added the avocado to the burger and as opposed to rising from three nanograms per whatever it was, uh, it rose to, it, it stayed at like three, three, two. So the avocado deflamed that small little uptick of, of the one cytokine that was still in normal range. So it was totally irrelevant. So the premise of the movie is frankly BS. Mm. It, the, the primary paper that proved uh, inflammation didn't even show any increase in inflammation. So if you take, a very high calorie like meal, like say, let's just do a thousand calories of, of a bunch of like, well, what's on the cover of my book. Yeah. And then yeah. you, and then you take, and I don't know what the amount will be because it's variable from person to person and you have them take, you know, two or three grams of turmeric or do a couple of shots of tart cherry or even this, by the way, even red wine functions to deflame the polyphenols, the colorful. So polyphenols are colorful substances in food, carotenoids and polyphenols. The polyphenols deflame the gut and the food as you're digesting it. So there is something to it. It's just not as profound and amazing as the hopeful people think it is. Now, here's the thing. If someone says to me, so if I was you know, in, in, in an office and practicing and working, what I, oh, you know, when I do my tart cherry, I feel great. I wouldn't say, well, it's all placebo. I'll say, great. <laughs> Yes, yeah. fantastic. So, so, so now here's we're going to do waist hip ratio now. So you see your waist hip ratio is uh, is is if you're female is 0.9. It should be below 0.8. So in addition to your tar cherry, you want to get your waist down so your waist hip ratio is proper. And if it was a guy, same thing. So I would just say that's great, and then get their 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 physical. So for you, muscle fat, um, muscle joint bone, all this stuff that you like. Tape measure waist circumference. So waist circumference and then hip ratio. So you take waist, hip ratio, and that's all you got to do. If people have normal waist hip ratios, as long as they have some muscle mass, their body will basically be deflamed. You can avoid all the chemistry. Mm. It's mm. beautiful. So, so blood pressure, waist circumference, 
those two are part of the metabolic syndrome markers. If they're elevated, their in chemistry will be inflamed. And then you take wasted ratio, cross it with BMI. So for all the physical therapists and chiropractors and MDs who don't want to do a lot of lab work and they just want to like do just just get after treatments and then do some basic approach to deflame people, waist circumference, waist blood pressure, waist ratio, BMI. If those are elevated or abnormal, the flame is on. So you want to get it back those back to normal, and you can avoid all the chemistry if you want. Yeah, I think that's something really important. One thing you started to touch on a little bit was this idea that if you eat, say, a burger, something that was inflammatory, <laughs> there it comes again. Put the pinky up. Just seal the deal. Seal the deal. I don't. Do, I don't do. I don't even know how to do pinky. Yeah. So I, sometimes not, it just happens. Here. I don't do it on purpose, but here. it just goes. I, don't, I never do pinky. I'm not a pinky guy. It's all right. That's fair. Those with big, strong hands do. Um, you you hinted at this idea of there's certain foods that when we get into this gut bioreactor will change or counterbalance some of maybe the inflammatory pieces. Can you just briefly talk a little bit about what is growing like crazy, which is this idea of the gut microbiome and then its ideas about how that affects our health dramatically. I'm not asking you to uh, deep dive a lot of these topics and the hypotheticals, but I will say that there is a growing message that you know certain providers will order a certain number of tests that have a certain question and reliability and then be able to explain to a high level of certainty the actions or supplements you should take off the wall that they recommend. And that is going to correct all your problems. It comes back to this idea that we can supplement our way out of a bad consumption diet. My question to that is, is that Every time I've seen, uh, say, this group of, of providers that or this this mindset, is that every time that they go through this very thorough process of analysis of nutrition, it sounds really good. Everything I've seen on the reports that that certain individuals have had, it looks really cool. Um, there's a lot of intimidation with it. There's 10, 12 supplements they recommend. And in the end, their whole idea is, hey, there's something off the gut microbiome. When we do your stool sample and we do your other these other labs of drawing your blood, we get back, we get all of these results. And then the answer is going to be these supplements are going to fix it. <laughs> That's what seems to be the A plus B equals C. Your gut's off. Here's the list of supplements you need to consume. We're going to redo your stool sample. We're going to redo the, your blood work. And then now you're going to be cured. I feel like that is a, a hammer and nail scenario from what I see, at least in the Nashville region, so to speak, of consumerism of, to this, this healthcare nutrition model. And I just don't know many people that I would uh, look to their expert opinion on it more so than yourself. So can you explain maybe the narrative for that model and then what it would be like in maybe a, a sense of looking at it from understanding all the literature, not the, the experimental testing, if that makes sense? Well, well, first of all, there is no literature that shows that supplements cure the microbiome. That, of course, doesn't exist. So what, what they look at would be a study that shows a subtle shift of benefit. That's that's what most of the animal models show or the or even the uh the uh the 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 human models. So so what will happen is you'll have like say um you know an anxiety scale and if you're and if you're if you're here, you know, you're anxious. So you so you do the the the, the, the probiotic and it takes you down a couple of ticks. You're still anxious. Your life still sucks. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's what they miss because they don't actually go and read the papers. Got it. And and I think a lot of the natural practitioners and some and some MDs too get fall into this and you know they just feel like the the non MDs they want to feel like they're prescribing stuff to be a real doctor and then the MDs will fall into that they're already prescribing stuff so it's just kind of natural to them. But when it comes to the gut, nothing is worse for the gut than refined sugar, flour, and oils. That completely disrupts the normal gut microbiota. It creates a shift that occurs 
in, in the microbiota. It creates an overgrowth pattern. And then when the overgrowth occurs, whether it's massive or small, then there's a greater release of, of, of bacterial components when one eats those foods and they get released into circulation. It's called endotoxin. And you have them in the mouth. You've, you've heard for sure, you I'm sure, and obviously, and, and, and most of your listeners at some point, they heard that, that if your teeth are really bad, it contributes to heart disease. You've, you've heard that? Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the bacteria in the mouth that, that, the, uh, that the hygienists scrape away, they're gram-negative bacteria versus gram-positive. It's just how they stain. But the difference is that the gram-negative bacteria have two layers of their, outer, of their cell wall. And the outer layer, you have this thing called endotoxin. So when you expose these bacteria in the gut to sugar, flour, and refined oils, or sugar, flour, and any kind, mm -hmm. endotoxin is released, it gets absorbed, and that creates the flame. So, so probiotics help to reduce that a little bit. But nothing, you cannot do the triple cheeseburger, extra fries, and cherry shake, and expect to take some tart cherry and probiotics. <laughs> God, my face looks so weird and huge when I come up close. Like I just that. don't know why we even do this show if you're just going <laughs> to shit on all of my favorite things, David. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good example, though. But clearly, you see, you got yeah. it under control. So, so, so the way to do that, though, is to do it like you could do it once a week and just be an absolute ravenous animal once a week. Yeah. Because you see, just a blast of lipemia, or fat and sugar after you eat once in a while is not enough to initiate the type of chronic inflammatory signaling required to create disease. Okay. So let me re, re say that. Um, and then you fix I'm gonna it. Pop for a me. Light while I'm, I'm, I'm going to just pop a light on while, while, while I, I can hear you. I'm walking oh. away to put a light on. Oh. I can't wait to talk oh. to this plant right now. All right. Just so you're plant, saying. You <laughs> <laughs> See the lights on now. A uh, little shop of horrors. Um, so basically, what I feel like I interpreted that you just said is that if I. If I'm thinking in the terms of this gut microbiome, which everyone is buzzing about right now, is that if I eat these oils, these sugars, these refined carbohydrates, that my bacteria, the things that are going to help my GI break down my food are now going to change in such a way that it changed my overall health. Yes. So- and there's, there there's a titration level that occurs. So for example, so my, 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 my great aunt, she liked her sweets, but she didn't just live on sweets. She was, she was born in 1913 when they basically, you know, they, they grew half their food. So, so she always ate healthy food, but she dipped into the, you know, what I call the dietary crack, you know, the mm. sugar, flour, refined oil. So, so there's a, a, a level and, and the way you find out if you really want to know if you if where your level is, is that you got to get a glucometer and keep your glucose in the normal range. And then you know what your five guys threshold is. And that's how you want to do it. What's my donut threshold? Get that glucometer out and then you'll know. That's awesome, man. So you, see you have a marker. So you have a, you have a marker. Brother. I think it's perfect. I loved the show. Every topic we covered, I think, was very vital, something important to get through. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I have about nine more topics that I've got to pin you down for because the people need to understand the real life common sense approach to these things. And I really hope they check out the new book, especially on immunity, because it's such a topic that is so overblown or misunderstood or misstated that I think it could be something that could really go a long way for a lot of people. And I would love everyone's questions, everyone's shares, and then we will be able to tackle those next time. David, thank you so much for joining the show. You're the man. Can't wait to do it again. Cheers, Thanks brother. Take care, brother. There you go.